You're listening to English with Monty, the podcast about the English language. If you're an English language learner, have a keen interest in language, or you're a teacher, then this podcast is for you. We give tips and advice and discuss topics about learning and teaching. We hope you find it fun and informative that it gives you help and encouragement in your journey with the English language. Hello there, welcome to English with Monty. We're on episode 12 now and we're going to build some questions from some more English learners just to give them some feedback and give them some ideas about learning the English language. And Gideon's back with me today after two episode break. Are you glad to be back? Delighted to be back. You invited me back, John. I was kind of wondering if you were, if you were going to ask me back or not. I'm, I'm sitting sorry. here twiddling my th thumbs waiting for the phone to ring. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry about that. Some people sometimes take priority over you, but I never forget you. And I always want to get you involved, Gideon. That's nice. You're saying <laughs> the right things again. How are things? I hear you're in Mallorca. I am in Mallorca. Don't tell the French authorities, but uh, I have come here and uh, no lockdown in Mallorca, so I can wander around freely. Well, it's nice. It's a very nice place. Okay, so you've been hugging everybody, is that right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's still not permitted, but despite my lunges, I've been um, <laughs> rejected, pushed away at every step. Yeah, no, no, I'm following the rules, of course, social Excellent. distancing rules. Yes, yes. Okay, but I am jealous and I, I hope it rains soon in Mallorca, uh, <laughs> just like it is here in London. We've got some interesting questions today from English learners. Also, I've included two kind of questions they're not really questions but they were talking about what makes good English teacher they were supposed to be included with our original episode which I think was episode six they weren't included because they missed the cut they weren't quick enough to get in there okay Gideon and I are going to answer some questions give our insights pearls of wisdom how about Julia from Germany hi John thanks so much for the opportunity to ask you a question and my question will be regarding speaking English on an advanced level, because my problem is that I can communicate more or less fluently now, but I'm still struggling to express myself, finding the right words or to respond very quickly. Yeah, I guess being an advanced English speaker now, I've reached a certain level of English, but I'm kind of stuck there and I don't make any improvements anymore. So I wanted to ask you for an advice or a tip on that. Do you have any suggestions what I can do to keep improving my English? Any tip would be much appreciated. Julia from Germany was talking about the idea of being at an advanced level. How do you look at improving when you get to a very high level in the English language? What are your thoughts on that one? That's a very good question because a lot of learners get stuck at intermediate level, don't they? They reach a certain level and then they feel like they're not progressing anymore. I think one of the key things, there are, there are lots of elements, but I think reading, that brings up the level to get the more complex vocabulary. Reading is very important, probably a lot more than that as well, but reading is very, very important. And you can tell the difference if someone reads a lot in English. This is true, isn't it? Yeah, and I guess it depends on what you're reading about, doesn't it? I mean, obviously, if you want to learn about a specific subject or use vocabulary from a specific subject, then I think that's very useful, isn't it, to read either articles related to it or, you know, a book related to it. Yeah, I think reading things that are challenging, exactly. Do you have any other ideas about how to improve from an intermediate level to advanced level? To an advanced level? Well, I suppose it's trying to, I mean, this is a quite a difficult thing to do, isn't it, potentially for some people, but try and kind of have in-depth discussions with native speakers and I guess that's quite a difficult thing to do sometimes but maybe join a debating society. That works yes. I had a student, a Turkish student that joined the debating society in London and he found it very useful and, and you could certainly see that it improved his level of English so I think you know debating a society is quite a nice thing to do or even acting as well. I mean if people go to an acting course perhaps that can help because it can help in terms of giving better pronunciation potentially or 
or using words in a more varied way. That's good advice. I didn't think of that. Yeah, absolutely. Those are a few good things to do, definitely. And I guess they do exist. You you can access these kind of things online. I'll just wait one point, though, that I think for advanced learners, they think they're not progressing, but they are. Because, of course, if you're a beginner, you can like, double your vocabulary over a couple of days. Mm. And so you you absolutely notice the difference, even at a lower intermediate level. But once you advance and you're just adding little bits and pieces here and there to your English, then you just don't notice it as much. But yes, you are improving. This is very true, isn't it? I think that's probably one of the elements in terms of thinking about English in general, though, isn't it? That when you do get to a very high level, you don't notice. You, you kind of plateau, don't you, very quickly? Seemingly stay at that one level. But yeah, you're right. You do improve. It's just that you may not be so conscious about it. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to David from Spain. Hi, John and Gideon. It's a pleasure to be on your show today. I've been waiting for John to invite me for ages, to be honest. My question, have you ever wondered what would English lessons be like for household names such as Mourinho or Pochettino, for example, or Guardiola? I mean, for popular top professionals, foreigners working in the UK, I'm asking this because some of them seem quite limited in their communication skills. I also know that some of them have learned English quite late in their life or just started to learn English when they moved to the UK for work. This is my question, really. If you were the teacher for one of them, how would you prepare the lesson? I think David's was a nice one. He was talking about was it football players or football managers or both? Ah, uh, yeah, that's curious. Uh, well, was it f managers or, or footballers or, or both? Well, he mentioned managers because he mentioned Mourinho. Okay. Some other guy. <laughs> some other, <laughs> <Yeah>. some other. <laughs> <porn>. <laughs> he, meant, he mentioned Pochettino, did he? You yeah. were really showing how little we know about football here. I think you should answer this first. <laughs> I'm not really an expert in football. I, I would say that, that really even English-speaking managers, they have a reputation, sometimes justified. English players as well have a reputation of not being grammatically correct all the time and sort of mixing up their words and getting the wrong words. So I don't think it's just limited to foreigners in England. In fact, some of them speak English very well. I mean, the uh, Liverpool manager, I've forgotten his name now, what is it, Liverpool manager? Um, Jürgen Klopp. He speaks English really well, better than most natives. I think maybe he's got a strong German accent. You are right, though. He does speak extremely well. That's very true. I'm just re remembering a kind of things that uh, English players and English managers used to say. I remember the quote from Ian Rush, who was the English, or was he Welsh, player and he, he played for Juventus as a centre forward and they asked him so what's it like living in Turin and playing for Juventus and he goes well you know being in Turin it's like being in a foreign country <laughs> <laughs> that's a good answer isn't it yeah so, okay well you are in a foreign country uh, yeah <laughs> I think it was Ron Saunders or somebody he had a quote he said complaining about allegations there are lots of allegations Allegations have all very well, but I would like to know who these alligators are. <laughs> I mean, I think David's question was very serious, though, and we're not really answering it. I have some ideas. Go ahead. If I was teaching somebody, I would focus, first of all, on the football language. So on the football pitch or on the sidelines they'd be able to say everything perfectly. Send it forward, run up there, score a goal. And then off the pitch, they may not be able to say anything. But that's the most important thing, right? Yeah. Or maybe practice their interview techniques with the TV. Yeah, but John, I mean, how well do they need to speak English? Their team has to win the game. Do they really care? Well, and if you're a player, you just have to shout like, man on, man on, on the ball. <laughs> or what? I don't know. <laughs> this is true. But I guess if they just know the basics, they know things like pass, they know things like shoot, they know things like tackle. I think that's enough, isn't it? 
as long as they can play well or they can coach well, that's the key, isn't it, really? I don't know, David, why do they not speak well? I would guess it's potentially just about education to some extent, isn't it? Perhaps when they were younger, didn't get educated particularly well in language, so it's more difficult for them to pick it up. Well, to be fair, because I don't want to sound too snobbish, but I mean, I think a lot of these players, they've dedicated their life to football and maybe they haven't completed all their education, haven't been to university. Maybe that hasn't been a priority for them. So a room for improvement, though. And I'm sure yeah. you, you make a good point. I mean, basically, David, if you can give us a good review to one of the famous football players you know, we will teach them and we'll get back to you and let you know. Hmm. We're moving on to Rachel next. Hello, John. I'm Rachel from India. My question is, I have difficulty in understanding British accent. So what is your suggestion to overcome that? She was talking about British accents, what she can do to understand British accents better. Because I was listening to her question and she's got a lovely accent, really. She does, yeah. From India, it's so, so beautiful, so mellifluous, musical. Very nice accent, actually. Yeah, no, I agree. But to understand accents, that is quite difficult because there are so many, aren't there? And you kind of start understanding more easily the accent of where you've studied English or who your teacher was. Maybe studying English from a, a guy from London or Birmingham, like John. Then, of course, if you meet someone from Texas, it's going to be more difficult. Maybe it's a good idea to kind of identify people who have quite strong accents and get into the habit of listening to them, particularly maybe celebrities and things like that. Listen to Jasper Carrot. You know, he has a Birmingham yeah. accent. Or somebody who has a very strong East End accent. I can't remember the guy that's always on at the moment. He's on from East Enders. What's his name? Guy Ritchie, is it? No, no, that's not Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie, J- Jason Stethan. Um, no, I don't know. I don't watch East Enders, John. <laughs> no, 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 well, neither no, do I. No, that's, that's, that's the problem. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> kind of focusing on people that are very much in the limelight so famous people in the uk get used to listening to them and get used to understanding what they're saying also as well i mean i think on audio books they're a bit better including different accents in audio books nowadays aren't they to make them a bit more colorful and interesting i agree i i would say though don't worry about understanding every word because if somebody with a regional accent using sort of a, a slang term that's only used in their um, region in their area then it, you you can't understand absolutely everything but just get a general idea of course and then i suppose we even struggle don't we as native speakers i mean if you don't know what somebody says from that local area i mean brody in my last episode was talking about a scottish phrase to say druk oh i don't know know that that's to be a dull day so when it's rainy um, okay as you said i don't think you have to know everything do you but the more you listen the easier it becomes i guess Mm, yeah. Hello, John, and everyone listening to Monty English. I'm Igor from Brazil. In my point of view, a good language teacher must know how to boost their students' confidence because in the process of learning a new language, I believe that self-confidence and a supportive environment are essential to keep doing progress. And here is my contribution to the podcast discussion. In your experience, John, which are the biggest barriers that stop the progress of learning a new language and how students and teachers can get over it? What do you think about Igor then? He was talking about barriers to making progress because he was also talking about the idea of the teacher giving you self-confidence so that you believe you can do things yourself. So what are the biggest barriers that teachers and students have in order to progress their English? I think that the barriers aren't linguistic, are they? The barriers are psychological. I think as long as you can find something which is interesting and you keep motivated and things are motivating you and the teacher's job to find things which keep the students motivated, then you carry on and you'll progress and uh, break down that wall. I think so. I think you're right. It is much more psychological, isn't it? It's more about doing something you enjoy doing as well and also how you engage I mean obviously if you engage well with your teacher and you have things to talk about and things to enjoy talking about that certainly helps and I think also 
making it fairly lighthearted, not too serious. I've had situations where I've had, I had a teacher once in a French teacher who was just very serious and I just wasn't interested in learning because she was so serious about the actual learning process. For me, that made me switch off. I didn't want to connect at all because to me, learning is not a serious experience. I feel as if you have to make it lighthearted, make it fun in some way. I completely agree with you, John. I mean, it's very rare, but occasionally, and I've had that experience too, a teacher could demotivate you as well by putting too much pressure on you or, or just being too serious and too glum. Yeah, that could be demotivating, but you, you've got to be strong as an individual as well as a student to realize yeah. that the language isn't just your teacher. You can get resources uh, beyond that. Change the teacher if, if necessary. Definitely. I, I mean, I've heard in some extreme cases where teachers have been drilling something and, and they've started crying. So, <laughs> Yes, uh, no comment. So it never happened in my class. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to hear more of Gideon's lovely voice on his own podcast about curious and interesting things about the English language, it's Zeitgeist Banana. Just search for Zeitgeist Banana where you get your podcasts. You will find some wonderful and interesting stories with more of me, too. We'll move on to Olya next. In my opinion, a really good teacher should be the main motivator of the process. This is rather easy to study if the student feels friendliness and support. Moreover, it's quite important to not overact on the student's small mistakes regarding, for example, grammar. And this is just my experience according to study English in Russia compared to study English with John. And it's very nice to hear about uh, your small successes during the learning process. I think the teacher should be firstly your kind of friend who shows you the new world with lots of interesting options and explains you how to use it in real life. Probably my main question deal with accent. How to get rid of it and is it worth getting rid of it at all? <laughs> Oh, you're from Russia, who's a good friend of mine. She was talking again about what makes a good English teacher. And she was saying that a good English teacher is somebody who is kind of friendly and open and somebody who comments on small bits of progress that you make and kind of encourages you and gives you the, that kind of support. And then she was saying about accents. Is it possible to get rid of your accent and is it worth getting rid of your accent? I would say about accents, you're not getting rid of your accent, you're getting another accent. Ah, that's very you, true, isn't it? Yeah. I've said this many times also on the YouTube channel. Why would you want to get rid of your accent? It's actually quite nice. Why do you want to speak like a British person or American? Of course, you want to speak clearly so we understand everything. But if you've got like a light Italian accent, French accent, Russian accent, whatever, it's nice. Why would you want to lose it? It's part of your identity. Why would you want to lose that? That's very true. I mean, it's possible as well, to some extent, I would say with the Russian accent, I don't know what you feel on the Russian accent, but sometimes I think when Russians speak, they sound a little bit abrupt. I think you can do small things just to change the way you kind of speak, as in maybe creating a, a longer vowel sound, thinking about the rhythm a bit more, which doesn't mean that you would lose your accent you would still keep that accent it's just that perhaps it just sounds a bit more closer to a native speaker and I mean I think that's probably quite important rather than losing the accent no I totally agree with you don't don't, don't misunderstand me I totally agree with you you know you can spend time improving your accent getting the sort of melody of English and speaking clearly but it's the law of diminishing returns so you get so far and I've had this before, students who speak English with a very good and clear accent. Of course, they've gone to the level you said, but then you spend so much time getting the last 1% right, the last 2% right. No, I want to speak exactly like you do. And you spend all your time and all your effort doing that. And that's the part which I have a problem with, not the part of you know improving and speaking clearly and with the right intonation. That's okay. But don't go down the, you know, spending thousands of hours just trying to get every sound precisely 
as a native speaker would say it. And I guess you could get a bit obsessed with it, couldn't you? And I don't think that's necessary at all, is it? And in my experience, the people who adopt those kind of accents, like, for example, the American accent, I remember going to Denmark and meeting a couple of ladies at a party and they, I thought they were American, but they weren't. They were were Danish. And the reason why they spoke English like an American is because they'd grown up with American TV and basically they'd copied it. They kind of picked up English from a very young age. So I think if you do pick something up from a very young age, then it's perfectly likely that you will sound like a native speaker. All my experience of uh, teaching English only or just being a, uh, an English uh, person uh, only half a dozen times, maybe less than that, I've heard a person who've learnt English and sounds like, like a native speaker. I think one of those persons was actually Danish, uh, so, but I can count it on one hand probably. It's interesting to hear it, isn't it? But I was totally fooled. For me, it was quite confusing actually thinking that the person was American, but actually they were a different nationality. So yeah. I think there is some value in always having a bit of your accent at the very yeah. least. yeah. yeah. No, I like it. I personally yeah, like it. And it's exotic, isn't it? It's nice. Yeah, exactly. Adds character. Yeah. The final one is from Nidin. This is Nidin Raj from South India. My question is, what's your opinion about one-on-one session for learning English language? This is quite an open one. We can interpret this in a number of different ways. But I think the reason why Nidin was talking about one-to-one lessons, so he said, what's the value of having one-to-one lessons? Uh, I think he's just more curious as to what benefits that would bring him. Nidin, I I know him very well. He's He's a good friend of mine. He already speaks English extremely well. And I guess a lot of people in India often do, don't they? Because they would communicate between each other quite often in English. Yeah. What do you think someone like himself would benefit? Of course, with one-to-one left, but there are advantages. We can focus exactly on his needs or her needs. We can delve deep into the way they speak English, find out any errors or, or ways they can improve their vocabulary, their grammar, their pronunciation, and we can focus exactly on what they need, which is something you can't always do in a, in a group class. It's more general. There's a lot of good reason to have uh, private lessons. The disadvantage too is, of course, if you're just having one teacher, private lessons, then you end up understanding just the teacher, but you go out into the wide world and you don't understand anyone else and you have difficulty speaking to others because you're just used to speaking to your one teacher. But on the whole, it's, it's good. It works pretty well. As long as the teacher is obviously good at what they do, they give you something extra, don't they, no matter what. And I think it's always a good idea for people to do that in terms of maybe thinking about things slightly differently as well. If you were to have, for example, you as their English teacher and me as their English teacher, then we think differently, right? So Nidin would probably benefit from you in certain ways and benefit from me in certain ways just because of our different approach towards it. I guess in an ideal world, it's nice to have more than one teacher uh, or just have more than one person's opinion about how to do things isn't it really yeah i thought i'd ask you this question as well i mean what's your experience with speaking to people from india in general i mean i often find that people in london do struggle with the way they pronounce things i find that sometimes the language can be a little bit old-fashioned in terms of the way people speak you mean like indian english for people who speak it yeah So my experience, there are two types of Indian English. There are the native speakers of English in India who who speak very clearly, very fluently with a little Indian lilt. And then you get Indians who've learnt English as a second language. And sometimes that's more difficult to understand, a bit more impenetrable. The, The accent's very different, often the vocabulary is different the grammar doesn't follow the same rules and there is an overlap i know that we were talking about this recently john but the word person the word people is the plural in the english speaking world most of the time however i hear a lot of indians saying persons instead of people that's just one example so there's a slight difference between general british english and indian english i think it is a very 
worthwhile topic to talk about, isn't it? I mean, maybe we could get a podcast episode out of it because yeah. I find as well there's a certain element of formality sometimes as well that you wouldn't get, for example, in Britain, which is almost from colonial days, isn't it, in a way, the way people very much give respect through the language, don't they? Yeah. Um, there's a certain element of formality where they would say things like sir that's true which is actually very nice to hear isn't it but it's quite odd also as well for a native speaker to hear it it sounds a bit too much doesn't it it sounds a bit too respectful doesn't it almost the, oh that's true there is a different level of respect you're actually right there yeah also they have different uh, words for things there's something quite quite nice like to ping i'll ping you later ping me at five o'clock when you when you finish work Oh, really? Ping? What does that mean? Ping. It's, it's nice, isn't it? It is use nice, that yeah. one? Use I that don't one use that one, no. I'm gonna no start, but... You should start using it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start pinging people. Yeah, with my, my small brown, is it? I'm pinging somebody? <laughs> yes. While drinking my small brown? <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm going to try that one. I think there's going to be plenty of phrases that we can talk about here to do with Indians or also, I guess, Sri Lankan, Bangladeshi and Pakistani as yeah, well. I mean, yeah. they, they would also be quite similar, wouldn't they? Yeah. I think there is always value in one-to-one -one lessons, isn't there? I think that's the conclusion. Oh, yeah, definitely. We spend a lot of time giving one-to-one -one lessons and they can be very, very rewarding for the teacher too. Very much so. And I think as well, the idea of doing online lessons nowadays, I don't know how you feel about this, but we've kind of all been forced to adapt to do online lessons virtually full time now because of lockdowns and you know obviously issues with covid and i think even doing online teaching makes you adapt doesn't it, it makes you teach in a different way and focus on different things and i always find it useful for <sighs> corrections in terms of the way people maybe spell or a reference point on chat, for example, I, I always find that very useful. I must admit I'm struggling a bit with online lessons because I, I like face-to-face. Uh, -face. You get the body language and the gestures and things, and uh, you don't have that so much online. But we've all got to adapt. The world has changed since, uh, I don't know, since the beginning of the year. Sure, but maybe you just need to use more videos or more interactive sure. stuff. Yeah, you're right, yeah. I agree. I mean, it is much more pleasurable, I think, for everybody, isn't it, face-to-face? online teaching does help and you do have that interactive element i mean i think the nicest thing i found was for example in a group lesson when somebody doesn't know a word or something i remember i had a turkish chap he didn't know the word for something so he got up went to his fridge and pulled it out of the fridge and showed everybody what was so, it in his fridge i can't remember what it was it might have been an onion or something was, i don't know it wasn't an onion but was it, anyway was it a, a book <laughs> but oh, his, his hat that's why i keep my hats in the turkish people keep their hats in fridges no, I didn't mean that was an anti-turkish thing like, i was just i was just wondering what the hell no i can't remember but i thought it was great yeah when you're at home and you're in front of a camera you have different props what if the thing isn't at home one if you want to talk about <laughs> no, a cannon or, or something stadium you can't you know you don't have that in your house well, then you can open your book on the World Stadia or open your okay. book on the most powerful cannon uh, <laughs> okay. show everybody. But also the internet. The internet really helps with that. I mean, I often Google things and show people pictures. Yeah. And yeah. I think as a visual aid, I think the internet really helps, doesn't it? Yeah. That in itself helps you to remember things, doesn't it? You're right. I can give you some lessons on online teaching. It's no problem. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll come back to you that. Okay. Thank you. I think we'll wrap up now. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Or would you like to promote something? Well, I think that I am going to promote our YouTube channel, Let Them Talk TV. We've got whatever, more than 160 videos on the English language, about learning English, at different grammar points, vocabulary, and pronunciation. Yeah. Excellent. So you're very much involved in online aids. That's very useful. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We've spoken about your podcast earlier on. 
So oh I, yes, I forgot the podcast. Sorry, I was promoting the YouTube channel, but you do have a podcast, and John is a regular guest. Yes, a gate crasher on the podcast. John from English with Monty. Our podcast, by the way, is called Zeitgeist Banana. If you want to find out why it's called Zeitgeist Banana, then you're going to have to listen to the first episode. Second episode, I think. Is it? Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but the second episode. Thanks very much for joining us, everybody. And you've been listening to English with Monty. Mm-hmm.